morning. This is Houseways Names. It's Thursday, March 24th. Um, we are going to uh, spend time this morning talking about education finance restructuring. That's the sort of general title. And we have um, uh, staff with us um, who are going to uh, guide us through whatever this discussion. Actually, the person who's going to guide us through is Emily. And um, and plus there are uh, any questions or announcements, I'm gonna turn it over to Emily, but let me just pause and not speak for one second, thanks. Um, because I wanna be sure that there's nothing going on today that we need to be concerned about. Um, okay, 703 is on the floor, but we got briefed on what that's the workforce bill. We got briefed on it yesterday. George is here, but I assume he'll be here in the afternoon. And his, he's got his part of that figured out. And I don't see any amendments on our other two bills. So I think we're, I think we're good. Um, as you heard on S53, I, after consulting with the speaker, I just postponed it for weeks so that we would have time to think about it. And so um, probably is this gonna end up in a conference committee, but I just thought it made it, there was no rush. So I figured it made sense to have it just sit on the calendar for a little bit while we got to um, figure out the best path forward. So is there anything else hanging over from yesterday that people wanna ask about or? Uh, Emily, it's all yours. Good morning again. Um, so we have the joint session at 10.30. Um, and so we're going to break ourselves up and break the morning up into two different pieces. One is sort of the last piece of, um, we were running through a checklist of pieces of the task force's report and just making sure everyone was sort of caught up on all of the pieces of that. And the last thing is one more sort of go round on the cost equity proposal from Julia and Catherine. And then we are going to shift gears quite significantly. And we're gonna hear from Jim and Abby about um, the recent court decision, Boyd versus State of Vermont, um, which was the um, Whitingham, residents in Whitingham, the town and the school sued the State of Vermont on education equity grounds. Um, and it sort of had the potential to be another Brigham, um, but was decided in the state's favor. And so we will hear about sort of the implications of that for education finance in the future. So that's a fun, like, non-numbers shift in conversation. Any questions, thoughts, or jump in? Um, Julia, I think you are first up with Catherine. And we have something on our patron view. Okay, good morning. I'm Julia Richter with the Joint Fiscal Office. There's a presentation put together on cost factor adjustments from Catherine Benham and myself, and it should be posted on the committee's page under my name. Um, does everyone have it in front of them before we start going through? Thanks. Okay. So, so we have a presentation that we've put together outlining cost factor adjustments, and it's really put into two parts. So the first part is more of a broad overview in words, just as to what cost factor adjustments are. Um, and then we'll go into a specific example and look at some numbers that might help to iron out some of the, the details. So, so I'm on page three of the presentation. Um, and cost factor adjustments are similar to pupil weights in the sense that they account for potential higher costs to schools with certain demographic characteristics. So these cost factor adjustments are set payments allocated to each district to account for the portion of students in a certain demographic category. 
These categories correspond with the same categories that are used for pupil weights. Um, in the task force report, the, the adjustments um, came from the same categories as the pupil weights in the task force reports. So really the major difference is that cost factor adjustments are offsetting revenues for school districts. So moving on to page four, um, these are the cost factor adjustments that were proposed by Professor Colby and the rest of her research team um, for FY 2023. And you can see in the left column, these are the different categories that I just spoke about. And the right column, those are the specific cost adjustments for each category. I won't go through all of the specific numbers unless a member of the committee would find that helpful. I think we're good. Okay, great. Then, um, then moving on to page five, this is really just a reminder as to how the homestead property tax rate and the income tax rate are currently calculated under current law. So as a reminder, the tax rates are adjusted based on the spending, um, the education spending per pupil in a district. So as you can see, um, for both the adjusted property tax rate and the adjusted income tax rate, it's really that base figure. So the $1 or the 2% multiplied by the per pupil spending and divided by the yield, which, which the committee just was working on the yield bill, as you are all aware. So you can see um, per pupil spending is currently calculated as the education spending divided by the equalized pupils. And the equalized pupils captures those pupil weights. And the education spending, I've broken it out there, or we've broken it out there, in terms of total spending and, and then subtracting all of the other offsetting revenues. So these are things like categorical aid, tuition revenues, prior year surpluses or deficits, and reserve funds. So that's really just summarizing how, how these rates are currently calculated. Um, moving on to slide six outlines the changes that, that would be happening with cost factor adjustments. So there are really two main changes that would occur. Um, the first is that the calculation of education spending would be changed. So this is where cost factor adjustments would be subtracted from total spending. Um, and this is, is frequently referred to as being taken off the top of the education fund. The second change is that equalized pupils are no longer used. So because cost factor adjustments would account for um, districts with certain demographic categories that may be higher cost to those districts, there would be no pupil weights and there'd be no equalized pupils. Instead of equalized pupils, the average daily membership would be used to calculate tax rates. And this is also referred to as ADM. So you can see on slide seven how those changes would, would be implemented in the calculation of the adjusted tax rates. So you can see that cost factor adjustments would directly affect the per pupil spending in two ways. First, instead of being divided by the per pupil spending, instead of being divided by equalized pupils, it would be divided by average daily membership. And the second is that education spending would now also subtract the cost factor adjustments. So that would be included in the offsetting revenues. Um, so that's, that's the broad picture in terms of what cost factor adjustments are. I'll pause now to see if Catherine wants to jump in to add anything or if there's any questions from the committee. Nope, I think we're good, thank you. Okay. I, oh, yeah, sorry. I have a question. <laughs> um, if, you, um, if you did cost factor adjustment for uh, one thing, 
um, I'll, I'll say poverty, and you did um, a change in waiting for another factor. What's your, I, don't, I never know which is on the numerator or the denominator. What, do you use ADM or do you use equalized pupils? I, I'm just trying to understand, can you mix and match and what happens to the formula when you do that? So, so I guess that the, I guess it's sort of two, I guess I, I see two answers to that question, two parts. The first part is that the task force report, um, I'll let Representative Kornheiser speak to the, the task force report. Um, with regards to what would happen to the formula, if you're looking at this slide seven, um, it would be a policy decision. So it would be really up to the committee in terms of how they wanted to adjust this formula. If you were to have equalized pupils, um, this would likely take the place of the denominator. So the bottom part of that ratio um, where, where you currently see ADM. I guess, I guess my question is, what, so what, what's logical? What, what makes sense? I mean, why would we choose one over the other? I think Catherine has that. Okay. Uh, sure. I think um, they're both trying to achieve the same thing. I think mixing and matching would be complicated. Um, I don't want to say you can't do it, but I don't think you could actually probably use the way that uh, Tammy Colby and her team calculated the numbers, I think you would have to go back and revisit those calculations. And um, uh, if, you're, if you're trying to be, um, provide clarity to, to people so they can understand what's happening and, and or why it is, it seems like that if you're dealing with demographic issues, you might choose to use the same uh, system for all of them. But I think, I think mathematically, we could probably make any of it work. It would just require, I'd have to think a little bit more about the math on it. It, it, it may not matter. I was just trying, I was, it's the first time I've seen ADM as the divisor, whatever, no. whatever it is. <laughs> um, and I was just trying to understand sort of, is that a, that, that, that's a commitment to, to change mm -hmm. how we do that. And we, it, it, uh, if we made that commitment, it sort of pushes us in a certain direction with all these factors. That, that's what I was trying to understand. Yeah, I, I get mathematically, you could probably do almost anything, but some things work better than others. So, okay, thank you. I think it would be profoundly confusing. Yeah, everyone, so I, I guess so I, I'm glad. <laughs> I think that's good. Thanks. Scott, did you want to add something on this? No, I think everything okay. okay. that said I agree. It would, it would make her already complicated system, more complicated. Right, right. <laughs> Carol? Well, I don't think complication is, you know, everybody feels this is complicated no matter what we do. But anyway, I, a statement, I realize. But what if we, what if on slide five, you didn't include, the education spending did not include all the things under total spending, like federal, state, tuition, prior year surpluses and reserve funds. What if it, what if that's not what that numerator were? So, so in terms of slide five, and I, I apologize if this is confusing based on the formatting, this blue box that you're seeing here with education spending equals, it's actually saying total spending and then subtracting all of these factors below total spending. So when you're calculating the per pupil spending, those those things that you that you're seeing here are are subtracted from from oh, education. I thought that spending. they were part of it. Okay, it's a subtraction sign on a dash. Yes, I can see it looking like a dash. I thought it was including it in there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. Well, that explains it's that. Such a good idea that we already do it. Kim. <laughs> <laughs> um. Thank you. Uh. Let's see. I guess either <laughs> for whoever wants to answer this question. Just click, we're calling cost factor adjustments is the same as what we were calling cost equity amounts or cost equity payments and the same as what Professor Colby has called the reverse foundation formula. Is that true or is there any subtle differences? Um, 
so so cost factor adjustments like for instance what you what you're seeing on slide four this is the same as what was referenced in the task force report as as um cost equity in in professors colby's january memo which is included here it is she did she did and her team reference it as cost adjustments based on school level cost function models um, so it really is referencing um, the same idea. I will invite Catherine or Representative Kornheiser to interject if they had anything else. Yep. And that's the same as, who used the word reverse foundation formula? Is that unrelated to this? Or right. is that what Professor Colby, I, I just wanna see if there's like a third. Professor Colby called it that in testimony, um, but in her like official memo, she refers to them as cost factors. But yes, it's all the same idea. Okay. And, and does, she, does she refer to weeding as a cost factor too, or does she only use that language? The, the math that leads to the weights, she described the team describes as cost factors when they're describing their methodology. Okay. All right. Thanks. Jim. Yeah, <clears throat> I think this language cost factor <clears throat> adjustment is more straightforward and easier to understand. I mean, it is what it is without going through some other language to try to get to the same thing. That's my opinion. <clears throat> it's helpful. I have to think this use of the word foundation is kind of a loaded word because we actually had a something we called the foundation formula in Vermont. I think, I mean, I don't, just, I, so I think that word is always confusing. I mean, I would look at our existing system. I would almost could call that a foundation formula because the foundation right now is federal and state categorical aid to, I mean, those are found, those are foundations that, districts use to build their budgets. I mean, so kind of by definition, I would call our existing a, a foundation formula of sorts, but that's not what we call it. <laughs> well, and foundation was pre-Brigham and it's kind of right. Yeah. Julia, I know we, um, the, the fact that tax rates can't go below one, um, can you, explain a little bit more about sort of what that means for the minimum amount of districts gonna spend? Sure, so there is currently in statute, as you just mentioned, that, that the tax rates can't go below one. So that that's essentially sets a floor in terms of what would make sense for a district to spend. Um, even if they were to spend a lower amount than the, um, even if they were to spend a lower amount than would be the, the minimum level that they would need to, to spend to reach that $1 tax rate, they still need to spend at least $1 um, for their tax rate. So for that, for that reason, um, there, there's, there's a floor in terms of what makes sense for a district to spend. Does that make sense? To me? But and I that see floor is based on the yield for that year, essentially, right? Yeah, yeah, what yeah. that dollar gets you is that year's yield. Mm -hmm. right. Yes, yes, thank you. <laughs> yeah, I don't sure. think it actually tells the district you have to spend more. You just send more money to the education. Correct. Thank you. <laughs> yes, yes, you don't get anything. You don't get anything extra. Yeah. David, um, I'm, I, you, neither of you may know the answer to this question, but I wonder whether there are any districts currently spending close to the yield or, or even less, you know, but have, have, have there been examples of districts that were on the cusp and decided they would spend a little more money because why not? That's a, that's a great question. I would have to go back and consult our model to see exactly how much districts are spending per pupil, but I do know that there's quite quite a range in terms of what districts decide to spend. Um, I'm happy to go back and, and look at the model and, and get back to you with a more firm answer about that. It's possible that Brad, who is there, there, I think, I don't know if he will magically, yes, magic Brad, hello. <laughs> Good morning. 
uh, very things into education. Yes, yes, there are normally one or two districts that are in, under current law. They're spending at a dollar. Their their tax rate is a dollar, which means their spending is right around the yield, or right at or slightly below the yield. And as Julia said, um, if you go too far below, you're just you're kind of you could have free money for all practical purposes because your rate's not going to change until you get up to a dollar. And my memory of looking at some of the various models of implementation of cost factor adjustments with various methodologies is that a few more districts were close to that one. That's got it. it oh, just, sorry, it was your question. Was it? Yeah. Well, yeah, and yeah. I, I just sorry, Scott, but uh, it just seems to me like going forward from a policy standpoint, we may want to think about this a little bit more. If it's incentivizing districts in theory to spend more than they otherwise would be happy to spend, just because it doesn't cost them any more at the tax rate. And then there's also an, an interesting dynamic that's starting to crop up. And my district's caught up in it, not caught up in it, it's, it's fine, but we have, um, I don't know if it's a two or $3,000 split between the income yield and the property yield right now. So my district, our pupils per pupil spending fell between those two numbers. So we're actually leaving money on the table for our income, household income payers but we're not for our property payers. So it's oh, kind of a okay. weird that's little, and I suspect, so that's a range of between about 13.3 and 16.3. I, I suspect we actually have quite a few districts that are in that, in that window. Julia, can you be mindful of that window for sort of future models that we're looking at and flag? Thank you. Sure. Anyone else on the? This slide or, okay, back to you, Julia. Thanks for popping up, Brad. All right, so, so now moving on to an example. Um, we've got that slide eight, just saying that we're moving on to an example. And then slide nine um, sort of lays the groundwork for what we're looking into. Um, and I really, before going into it, I do want to state that these districts that we'll be talking about are are fictional and have been created solely for exemplary purposes. Um, so, so here we're gonna be looking at two districts, District A and District B. Um, both districts have the same total education spending, the same level of categorical aid and um, offsetting revenues as under current law um, and the same ADM. The main difference between these two districts is that they have different numbers of pupils within the cost factor categories that we were just talking about. So, so we see that the average daily membership in both districts is 500, both have total education spending of 8 million, and both have offsetting revenues of 2 million. Um, the big difference is those cost factor adjustments. So, Julia, one second. So, I think I've had this trouble before. Um, you use the phrase total education spending, but what you're talking about is the voted budget, right? Correct. So they, by using the term total education spending in line two and then again in line five, yes. I, I'm afraid it's going to confuse people um, because we've always used the word education spending as a term of art. It, it means budget minus all this other stuff. Um, so anyway, I, I, I think I've you have yeah. pointed that out before because um, I, I think it's anyway. Oh. Thanks. Thank you for that for that clarification. Yes. So the total education spending that's referring to the budgets um, we that were voted. Word budget. Yeah. Just okay. Yeah. I will yeah. I will use that going forward. Um, it, it it does say total education spending in the slides, but I'll I'll try to be mindful of that um, throughout the rest of the presentation. And then the local education spending, that's those budgets subtracting the offsetting revenues. And then in this example, also subtracting the cost factor adjustments. Um, so, so moving on to, sorry, was there another question or, or oh, comment about that? Okay. Go back to you. Okay, then moving on to slide 10, this shows the, the breakdown of both districts, their number of pupils within the different cost factors. So you can see the leftmost column titled cost factor 
And then the second column titled FY 2023 cost adjustment, that's what we looked at earlier. Those are the numbers and the, the cost factors as proposed by Colby, Professor Colby and her team. Um, the next two columns under District A, that's saying the number of pupils in each of those cost factors, and then the cost factor adjustment in each of those cost factors. So for instance, in line three, where you see poverty, each pupil that would be, each pupil in the district that, that's falling into that category as defined is going to, um, the district will, will receive $10,480. Um, and that's that's trying to capture the average cost. Um, and so so in District A, in this ex example, they have 15 pupils in that category. So 15 multiplied by 10,480 brings us to 157,200. So that's the cost factor for cost factor adjustment for that that. Um, poverty for District A. You can see District B has 55 pupils in that category. So their cost factor adjustment is going to be higher than District A because there's more pupils that fall into that category. Um, and the same logic applies to, to the rest of the rows in the table. I won't go through all of the numbers unless that would be helpful. Um, the, the, the only other thing that I wanted to show was in in rows six and seven, you can see that both district A and district B have the same number of pupils in those categories. And because they have the same number of pupils, they're going to be receiving the same um, cost factor adjustment for those different categories. So, so I'll pause there and, and let you all digest this. I know it's a lot of numbers on this slide um, and I'm happy to answer any questions about it. Go ahead. Um, I just say, as I said earlier, Julia, this is much more straightforward, I think, for the average person to sort through it. So, yeah, I get it. Yeah, David. Yeah, I was thinking earlier, this is a really very helpful presentation, the, the content, but also the way you've laid it out. So, thank you for putting that thought into it. I, I'm just wondering now, though, looking at row nine, mm -hmm. uh, the small school line uh, <laughs> yeah so <laughs> district B has 200 pupils in less than 100 people schools but that means there's three of them right julia did you I'm catch sorry, that i'm <laughs> sorry i wasn't able to hear the, okay, the question right. so so line line row nine the cost yes. that fewer than 100 people to, so a school with fewer than 100 but in the illustration you're showing there are 200 people. Great, that's a, that's a great, great um, question. I appreciate it. I'll have, I have two responses. One is that it is an example district and, and we've put in these numbers really just to show you um, the way that the cost factor adjustments would sort out. If we're, if we're talking hypotheticals, how could this happen? Um, we are looking at two districts. So in theory, there could be, um, I believe under under the way that all of the assumptions behind the memo, there could be two small schools within the district. So so say there are, are three. So maybe you would have you know one small school with fifty students, one sc small school with fifty students, and one small school with one hundred students. And then maybe even one school that's not a small school with one hundred and fifty students that wouldn't be counted on that would still be in the district. Exactly. So, okay. So this is. This is a good example. I mean, it's a it's a plausible illustration, and for me anyway, it confuses things a little bit. So thank you for including it. I'll I'll, I'll want to think about it a little bit more. Sure. John. So, and maybe you all had this discussion when Professor Colby was here, and I was in a meeting. I think I missed a good part of that. But uh, um, and so if you've all been through it, I, I can catch up with Julia later. But the question I have is the interplay between the small school line, and I understand that it's an unlikely but plausible scenario, um, and the uh, population density line, and uh, what's happening there, um, and 
that ends up with 732,000 uh, basically taken off the, uh, but uh, you know, removed before we get to education spending. So, so what's, what's going on? Yeah, thank you for that question. Didn't, didn't you, it was your question, you weren't here, oh, so we skipped okay. it. I think she sent me an email about it later okay. that I, yes, but um, we didn't actually cover it. I, I guess I just, I just I can't visualize what's actually happening that we need, that 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 requires that money, that kind of, that level of adjustment. I just don't know. So it would be very best if it was duplicative. Well, that's part of, part of the question, but I guess, the yeah. But the, but I just need to understand what it what is what is going on. That's a lot. Um, I'm sorry, Jan. Which one are you talking about? I'm adding the small school line 427 in this example, and the population density line of 305, and I'm coming up with 732,000 and some change as a as a total figure that needs to be adjusted. And I'm trying to understand. Why? So you know, sort of just understanding. How do you explain to somebody why that's going on? That would make sense to them. And Julia, whether there's a sorry. Okay. Julia, do you want Brad to jump in, or do you want to? Sure. Do, okay, Brad's explained this one a few times rather than now. <laughs> okay. I'm not sure I'll explain it well, but um, I, I think I think it's because what what they what uh, Professor Colby's team found was there were two different things going on. There was there was the sparsity issue, which cost more money, and that that does the in this case the three hundred five thousand on line twelve, and then there are there is the small school issue separate from sparsity, um, which also they they recognize as, as costing more money. And then when when they were doing their statistical model, what they were finding was that small schools in sparse areas also had that same, had an issue. So I think what they're doing here, Representative Ansel, is looking at the fact that it's a small school which has its own cost, uh, additional costs in a sparse area, which also has its own additional costs. And that's why they tied the two together and get a small school, but it has to be in a, in a sparse area. Um, I'm not sure I can explain it any better than that, but that's my understanding from what Professor Colby said. And Brad, am I remembering right that in this hypothetical model, the hypothetical could work if line 12 had 400 students. So you could have 400 students in a sparse area, but only 200 of those students would be counted in a small school. Yes, that that, that is that is correct. The, 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 the population counted for the small school weight is the actual enrollment of the school, not the not the total population of the school district, like in line 11. Right. Sure. Well, I, I have to say, I, I've never believed okay. that uh, calculation yeah. and that it's that much more expensive to do in, in a sparse area for the population. But I thought the construct was that that was done at the district level. So that how could you have 200 students out of your 500 students getting the sparsity when it's done at the district level? I, 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 I think well, 500. it should be all of them. Yeah, it has to be all of them. Yes. That's, I, that's my understanding. I, yeah. I, I believe I believe it was just an oversight when Julie was doing this. I, I believe that she actually meant that line to be 500. In which case, that's a huge, huge figure. Huge figure. Um, and somehow, unless everybody is rural, which means it becomes sort of meaningless, then there needs to be a logical explanation for people about why it would cost that much more if you're have if you have a small school in a rural area, then if you have fifty five kids who are in poverty, I, I just I, I'm not I'm not sort of buying the logic of it, but um, maybe it's there. Well, one thing that's been interesting to me when I've looked at this is that the actual cost adjustment for poverty is much, much higher. But because in the for the rural weight, for the sparse weight, and for the small schools weight, you're counting all of the kids in the school, not just the kids in that. So it winds up having this very outsized impact because you're counting more people in that sort of category. Um, but we can have Professor Colby back in to explain sort of the math that led to it, too. Um, I have a hard time being convinced that, yeah. that, that that makes sense. That just, that just goes so far out of line 
with the reality that I gave you know, I see. Uh, yeah, I guess it doesn't necessarily not make sense to me just when we when we've heard people talking about scale and the, the you know overhead cost of small schools, small districts. Uh, but that's not my question. Uh, my question is back to the 200 on, on line nine. Uh, and, and I just want to be sure that I'm hearing this correctly. That so we have a district with 500 students. Uh, how did we? And Julia, please jump in here. If I maybe 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 I misunderstood, or maybe you had more time to think about it too. But is this a plausible scenario that 200 could be in line nine? I'll I'll jump in if you don't mind, Julia. Um, yes, it, it is because because especially with all the mergers that have taken place, we have a number of school districts that have quite a few people, but they still have more than one small school because the schools didn't necessarily close, but the school district merged, but not the schools themselves. So so having two hundred out of five hundred kids going to small schools in a school district is not implausible. Three three small schools adding up to two hundred kids. Three four two yep. you get two and hundred. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But, but line twelve should be five hundred. Yes. Thank you. I'm trying. To, uh, could could yeah? It, could there be? I, I can't. I don't know what a big a square mile that is. But can that? Could there be five hundred kids? Um, when you have fewer than 36 per square mile. What, what's how big would that okay. district be? <laughs> <laughs> you, 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 could, you could have, you could have, yeah, I think you can, you have I more than 100 once. kids in there. Yeah. Um, so you could, have, you could have more students on line 10 um, in, in, in that district. That would, be, that would be a possibility because you'd have a larger school and still would get that smaller small school grant. Sorry. And the other thing, I mean, Middlebury is a great example. You've got all these schools that around Middlebury, which would have qualified for this, but they don't because they're grouped in with Middlebury and it's the whole district, right? So are you saying those schools don't have the extra cost just because they're near a town that, you know, that they're merged with the town that does? Because I mean, it's, it's, the district as a whole. It's the district as a whole. Is dense, that's a part of it. Yeah, and one other thought is that one of the extra costs, of course, is transportation, and we and we will continue to do that separately, yeah. right? Because yeah. nobody is talking about building that in, right. so that is accounted for somewhere else. And it's actually controlled for in the study, the cost of transportation. I'm sure. Yeah. Yes. No, yeah. No question. Yes. 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 Yeah. Yeah. I yeah. understand that. Yeah. And, and, and if, if I could just jump oh. in for a second, um, I, I don't remember what the language actually says, it, but but I know in Middlebury's case, the current those small schools that merged currently into a larger district, districts that merged into a larger district, currently get their what were small school grants as the merger support grants. And I don't recall off the top of my head, Representative Kornheiser, please jump in here, if if there's they still get the merger support grant or if they get this instead. It's it's one or the other. They won't get both, if I recall correctly. My memory is in that example, they get the merger support grant, but I could be remembering wrong, so maybe I shouldn't have said anything. Um, Scott, did you? Yeah. I've lost my people. Um, okay. I, I certainly don't want to uh, speak for Professor Colby, nor do I know whether any of these numbers are the correct numbers necessarily. Um, but I think it's, um, I think the logic basically is, is that, you know, 85% of our school budgets are, to pay for people, bodies, salary. We have a four to one staff, staffing ratio in Vermont. And I think most of the research indicates is that a lot of our rural areas are really struggling to keep high quality educators and they tend to go to the more urban areas that can give them a bigger salary. And I think most of this, this adjustment speaks to what would rural areas need for resources to retain these high quality educators. So I don't know if any of these numbers are the right numbers, but I think that's the logic. Yeah. Yeah, go ahead, Jim. Yeah, um, that makes sense. I was looking at this page uh, and noticing first the easy one, which is purple 
pupils versus people per square mile. I mean, that's just read the language, figure that out. But then, yeah. as George and Dave were just talking, the differences between figuring this out on a school district versus supervisor union um, construct um, does add a little bit of confusion to what otherwise is, I think, a fairly straightforward presentation. And maybe um, having Professor Colton back in and, and asking her about that, what's potentially an anomaly would be helpful. One piece that I think came up in testimony from someone at the University of Education other than Brad, I don't remember who, was um, the idea that there was so much debate over what a geographically necessary small school was. And this was sort of a mathematical calculation of that idea, um, which is, I think, sort of an interesting angle on it. I'm not sure. Again, I don't want to speak for Professor Colby, um, but I thought that was an interesting way to think about it. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Discuss why, but there's nothing that says these districts would use this money for salaries. You know, and that I agree. Yeah. Rather than just lowering tax rates, there's no guarantees they would. And it might right. be more than just the salaries, given how difficult life for teachers is right now. You know, the, the, the numbers of you know uh, abuse and harassment, those kind of things. So Juliet, let's go back to finish up the presentation if we can. Sure. Um, so moving on to slide 11, I will just apologize up front to the committee. We re-ran the numbers and I forgot to change um, line one, which is total education spending. So I will adjust this and send it back to the committee, but that line one, it should be 12,000, uh, excuse me, 12 million for district A and B for total education spending, which and reflects their budget. budget. Should be total budget. Total budget. Total budget. So I'll change okay. that. Um, just so everyone is aware, we're all on the same page. Um, that total budget in line one is 12 million. So that correction aside, um, the the logic still holds true as to what we've spoken about. So we've got that total budget in line one, and then subtracting all offsetting revenues. Line three outlines the cost factor adjustments. Um, I've pulled that out of the, the, the offsetting revenues just so we can all see exactly what's happening with the cost factor adjustments, but there's no, there's no real difference in terms of the cost factor adjustments and the offsetting revenues in terms of the, the calculations. They're just being subtracted from the total budgets. Then we can see in line four, after subtracting the offsetting revenues from the budgets, what that local education spending would be. And we can see that while they have the same total budgets and the same um, offsetting revenues aside from cost factor adjustments, that their local education spending differs because their cost factor adjustments differ. And that corresponds with the different de demographics in these two example districts. We see in line five, they have the same average daily membership, but we see in line six that the local education spending per pupil also differ, differs in correspondence with those differences in line four. Um, and before moving on to calculating tax rates, I just want to say we're going to assume there's a property yield of 11,000 and an income yield of 13,500. Those have been chosen just because they're nice round numbers. Um, to make things a bit easier to follow. So I'll, are there any questions on this slide before oh, moving on? Yes, yeah, well, just a comment. Um, it's a good slide. Thank you, Julia. But this assumes that District B uses none of that tax capacity to improve its school. Yes. Right. Yeah. Thank you. So this assumes there's the same, they have the same, um, budget same, same um, spending decision yeah same spending decision same 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 everything so to speak with the exception of those demographics that are affecting the cost factor adjustments thank you for that clarification 
Yeah, and could you add that clarification to the slide when you fix it? Because I may refuse. I'm happy to do that. Yeah, I'm keeping a, a list of the clarifications yeah, I'll add. So people who are outside the building can follow along and get it right. Thank you. Definitely. Okay, back to you. Okay, great. So um, those clarifications, keeping them all in mind. We'll move on to slide 12. And this is an example of calculating the tax rates. So that first box that we're seeing here, that's what we were speaking about earlier um, when we were going through the overview. And then the, the lower two boxes are just plugging in the numbers we were just looking at in slide 11 into their respective places, um, into those formulas. So we can see that assuming the, the budgets are the same, there's the same um, education spending decisions by both districts, that they would have different tax rates, spending adjusted tax rates because of those different cost factor adjustment payments, assuming all other things within the districts remain the same. Julia, so this, it, these charts are, are really good. And um, I'm, I'm, the, the comment that Scott made uh, just uh, sort of makes me understand what the, what the question is here. Is the, is the goal here then to have District B uh, spend, I know that's supposed to be 12 million, but 12 million plus the 1.6, is that it? because we want that district to provide that level of educational opportunity to all its kids and we think they can't unless they spend it. I mean, is that really what we're, what, what, is that what's driving this discussion? And, and we think they can't provide that level of educational opportunity at the 12 million. Is that what we're talking about? The way I think of it is, is that we want to make sure that every school district has the tax capacity to offer their kids an excellent education. Right? But we, That's the way I think of it. I mean, as, as policymakers, yeah. aren't we wanting those kids to get that level of educational opportunity? And aren't we saying if once we've done all this, that the only way they can get it is that if they spend 12 million plus. This is what we think they need to, to provide that. I mean, I think I think you have to you have to believe that or you don't want to do all this. Exactly. If we if we want district A to district B to offer the same quality education as, as district A, a yeah. but, uh, but we want them to do it. Right. We don't want them just to be able to do it. And so a scenario that was sort of demonstrating that more clearly would start with having the same tax rate and working backwards yeah. to a yeah. higher budget right. for the district with more adjustments. Right, and that's sort of what I yeah. mentally did. That's why these, these slides are great um, because they kind of take you to, um, yes, I think that has to be what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. yeah. And education is working on the EQS and enforcement. Piece yeah, of this well. yeah. yeah. And I know you've been, you've yeah. talked about that a lot. Yeah. Caleb? I don't have a question, and so I, I'm happy to wait. I just know we have another topic, and I, I'd love to be able to make a comment generally, but I don't want to do that too soon. Is now, okay, I think I think this is yes. Okay. This is quite a. So I think this is a really interesting presentation, a well done presentation. Thank you, Julia. Um, we I wanted to say we have been talking about a lot of these things throughout the year, which has been great to kind of have these education Thursdays. Um, <laughs> while that's been happening, though, uh, the Senate's been working on this, and we haven't had a lot of chance to talk about this on SEC reading today, S-287. The Senate uh, has rejected this concept, you know, and I think that that's, um, I'm not saying anything about that other than that if, if S-287 passes, it contains none of this. And we're past crossover, and so if we were to go with this instead of what the Senate's done to me, as just someone looking at it, that feels like something that would be pretty hard to reconcile in a committee of conference. And so while I find this a very interesting thought exercise at this point in the session, I do find myself a little confused over where we would seek to deploy this. And I'm, I'm interested, I'm listening. I just wanted to say that because S-287 is coming to us, and it is um, it is a bill that contains none of this concept, despite that they talked about it 
uh, extensively. And so I just wanted to kind of put that out there that this is a good conversation. I'm glad we're having it. At, at some point, I think we're going to have to move from divergent thinking to convergent thinking, and that will involve what the Senate has done. <laughs> so uh, thank you for letting me say that. Um, I think George's going to jump in a second. I just want to say I had high hopes that the Senate would have passed it by now and we would be talking about that bill today. Um, yes, but it's yes. been moved on their calendar yes. a few times. And so I think it'll be fun to look at the details of it very soon. Because the detail there's a lot in their details, George. There is it's it's got a lot in it. Yes. I'd say Caleb, have faith in your conferees. <laughs> <laughs> well yeah. I do think that you know diametrically opposed um, in some sense this concept of committees of conference can lead to to no bill, and this is so weighty, it's so important that it 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 concerns me to think of a committee of conference deadlocked over this critical critical issue of Vermont students. Trust in your conference. Well, I I, <laughs> I have seen committees of conference that are not come up with much. Jim, and then we're going to go back to Julia for the yeah, last slide. Briefly, um, Caleb, good question, good point. Um, be a bummer to end up with that. Um, but as as we work through this, um, the committee of conference of some sort on something, and it would be um, this this work would be far more useful completed and corrected. You know the adjustments that have been discussed this morning um, in a presentation to the senators, so that they see the merits of this approach. And so I would say. It's, it's, and it's simplistic, but let's keep going and see where we end up because it's more useful to all of us, I think. And I, you know, I mean, I think we regularly, I think each body passes the policies that they think are best and then find their way towards each other. And I, um, there's a lot of commonalities between both strategies. They're both adjusting for cost factors and finding sort of the best way to do it. Um, Julia, you have one slide left. I do have one slide left. So that's slide 13. And this is really just summarizing what we've been through today. So what are cost factor adjustments? They are set payments allocated to each district to account for the portion of students in a certain demographic category. And how would the calculation of tax rates change with cost factor adjustments? As we just went through, many aspects would not change. Districts would still have the voter approved school budgets. They would still subtract the offsetting revenues from these budgets. And the remaining education spending per pupil would still be funded through the spending adjusted tax rates, which we just spoke about. The two main changes that we've been over today to current law would be that these cost factor adjustments would be included in the offsetting revenues when they're subtracted from the budgets. And that education spending per pupil would be calculated with the average daily membership and not with equalized pupils. So, so that's the summary slide. Um, we're happy to answer any other questions that, that you all may have. Thank you, Julie. Thank you both. Yeah. Really appreciate it. And um, yeah. I, I would love to see the, the slide as uh, the chair outlined where we start with The same tax rate. The same tax rate yeah. and then work backwards to to the you know why the spending is the spending how the spending can differ in the, the two scenarios. Yeah, we can definitely work on that um, and get back to the committee with with that additional information. It's it's a great a great suggestion. Um, and it would, would kind of show the, the flip side of this construct. Thank you. Thank you both, really appreciate it. We're gonna take a 10 minute break and then talk about court cases.